Welcome, my name is uh, Trevor Garrett. I'm the new uh, pastor of Spiritual Formation here at Copper Hills Church. Uh, We're still working on my title, actually. My buddy Tim Brown said, that's a terrible title, Trevor. We need a new title. No one understands it. So we're working on that. Pastor of Spiritual Disciplines, maybe. Pastor of Everyday Life. Pastor of Money, Sex, and Power. I don't know. Um... Or my favorite, this is what I'm going for, uh, Supreme Allied Commander of Coalition Forces of Spiritual Formation in the West Wing Mountain Theater of Operations. Uh, Brad didn't sign off on it, though. He's pretentious or didn't fit on the business card or something like that. Uh, That's that's fine. Anyway, uh, it's so great to be here. Where's Butch? Thank you for the shout out uh, this morning. Did you guys hear that? Uh, Wasn't it great? Uh, Drew and Taylor leading worship last week. Yeah! And also Trevor preached. Yeah! Last week, so I'm back again. I'm actually um, not supposed to be preaching this morning. In fact, I was up north at the men's summit, men's ministry summit, and had to come back. Sadly, Pastor Brad's beloved uncle uh, passed away, and Brad had to travel back to uh, Canada for the funeral. And so our thoughts and prayers are are with uh, Brad and Alfie. Um, I just did want to mention this uncle, Uncle Lorne. Alfie, is that right? Uncle Lorne. Uh, very successful businessman, had a real knack for it, I guess, generated some wealth up there in Canada, and just really liked to use that for kingdom purposes. And uh, when Brad and Alfie were going to move down here, he pulled Brad aside and said, how much is it going to cost to move your family? And said, uh, I'd, I'd like to pay for that. And, and uh, if you have needs, uh, call me, and uh, I'd like to help. And I guess there was a few times where uh, that help really was needed. So we honor uh, Uncle Lorne. This morning, interesting to me how he has influenced all of us, a bunch of lives in Arizona, uh, by giving a little bit of his offering back up there in Canada. So we remember Brad and his uncle Lauren. Also uh, noteworthy, though, in 20 years, I guess, since starting this church, Pastor Brad has never been called away in a family emergency like this and had to miss preaching. This is actually the first time in 20 years, uh, and happens just as he's bringing in. Uh, the backup preachers. So, <laughs> praise God. God's provision and timing is perfect. And, and the final thing I just want to mention is this morning, um, I'm celebrating uh, my 23rd anniversary with my incredible <laughs> wife, Amy. It's actually, she counts it as our 50th anniversary because every year with me is like, kind of like two years. It's like a dog year thing. It's just uh, a bit harder for her. Uh, than for me, but praise God. Let's pray for a second. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this chance. We remember Pastor Brad right now with his family, that he would be a comfort. And uh, we thank you for Uncle Lauren and uh, all that he did and all that he was. And we ask for your presence right now, Holy Spirit, with us. Be our teacher. Be our teacher. Show us. Teach us what you want to teach us this morning. We humble ourselves before you. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Okay. Let's get into the scriptures here. So we're in the middle of a series called Me and My Big Mouth. Now, why would we ever do, be focusing on that? Isn't there more important things we could be focusing on? Could be love, relationships, the kingdom, inner healing. Why are we taking a gratuitous three weeks to talk about our words and what comes out of our mouth? Well, last week we looked at chapter 1 in, uh, of the book of James, was giving us some insight into this. James, as we discussed, is a letter, it's a book in the Bible, it's a letter written by Jesus' brother to first century Christians who, under pressure in their culture, were struggling to actually live out Jesus' teaching and not just talk a good game. And we discovered that that is not just a first century problem. That is a 21st century problem as well. Last week we read in James in uh, chapter 1, verse 19, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. And we saw how James and also Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount traces the roots of our speech and how we talk to the source of those words down into our hearts. So our words are important because they reveal our hearts, right? So... Let's go a little bit deeper here as we get into James chapter 3. Uh, let's read some of this out. We're going to go James chapter 3, 1 to 6. Here we go. This is the word of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. Too late. Already took the job. Um, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Yikes. Uh, indeed, we all make many mistakes. 
For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. Really? We, uh, we can make a large horse go out wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth, and a small rudder makes, up, makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire, and among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on, on fire by hell itself. Whoa! Pretty strong language about how we talk and how we use our words. Can something you say really corrupt your whole body and set your life on fire? Is this really true? Or is this like exaggeration? Uh, to make a point, let's, hyperbole, let's uh, unpack this uh, a little bit. So notice the clear parallelism that James is using here. Controlling our tongue linked to controlling our lives, but notice this parallel. Small bit controls the direction of a big horse. Small rudder uh, 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 directs a, a, a big ship. A small thing can make a grand speech. A tiny spark can make a big fire. So uh, this kind of repetition... I feel like it's just hammering on the same point because it must be important. Uh, and I would translate, uh, let, me, let me translate how I see the point that James is trying to make here. Uh, in the battle for the life of Christ in you, in me, in us, there are some seemingly small areas which, like a small bit, small rudder, tiny spark, can change the whole direction of your life. What do you think about that? Now, you know... There is a war being waged for your life right now, right? At this very moment, right? Spiritual forces for good and evil are acting on us at any given time. 1 Peter 5, 8. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You know we're in that right now. Ephesians 6, 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, against the powers and the principalities. So, so you're aware of this. Right? I'm sure you are. You know you're in a struggle. You've felt the pull different ways. You've felt that struggle in your week, I bet, sometimes. Our situation right now is one of spiritual warfare. Have you considered then, in the middle of this war for your life, uh, that some territory in your life might be more strategic than others? And that some of the most strategic parts of your life might be some small, seemingly insignificant piece of territory that you're not paying attention to. Let me illustrate this. So, I'm getting super excited about American history. No cheers for that. Nervous laughter. Uh, my kids are learning it. Also, too many lunches with Tim Rosenbaum, where's he? Uh, history is a history teacher. Um, uh, moreover, my other career is as a strategy consultant, is what, sort of what I came from in my background. So I find all the battles very interesting of how they're won and what happened. Anyway, I'm just getting up to speed uh, on the Civil War. Totally interesting to me. Because, maybe a little bit because Canada didn't have one, right? So, um, at, so at 4 p.m. on July 2nd, 1863, what happened? People are like, I didn't know there was going to be a test. Was there going to be, is there, you're having math anxiety from history right now, aren't you? Uh, everybody did the one eye closed, one eye open thing. Like, I don't know what happened. I am talking, of course, about the battle of Gettysburg. Good. Everyone knows about Gettysburg, right? Our, on vision night, Pastor Brad shared the Gettysburg address as an example of casting vision. So um, I looked into this. I didn't, I didn't really know what happened. So... Uh, like apparently Gettysburg was the, they called the high water mark uh, of the rebellion. This was as far as the Confederate army uh, pushed north. This uh, small, seemingly insignificant little town would be the point where the Civil War would turn. And outside this small, seemingly insignificant little town is a small, seemingly insignificant little hill called Little Round Top. Have you heard of this? And on that seemingly insignificant little hill is a statue of a seemingly insignificant little guy. Uh, 
he's, uh, he's he, a, a general. There's a general that, I've, that I'd never heard of. And I haven't been there. Apparently it says, Savior of the Union on the statue. I owe a bit of this to Rick Joyner, Joyner who's a history buff. Who is this guy? This is a statue of General Governor Kemble Warren. Apparently, President, President Lincoln said, five minutes in the life of this general possibly meant more for the outcome of the Civil War than all the other decisions made by all the other generals combined. What? And he didn't even, he was the kind of general, he didn't even command troops, really. He was a general in the engineering corps. He was an engineer, just saying. Is your, Drew, your dad, is your dad here today? He's an engineer. He came up to me after the service and said, I'm an engineer too. Uh, my background's engineering if you're here this week. Uh, he commanded the engineering corps. He was an engineer. So, so what did he actually do? Well, I guess uh, before the battle of Gettysburg, uh, what's happening, this general was scouting around, you know, on his horse, like looking around, and he gets up on this little hill, this little hill called Little Round Top, and saw immediately that this was the most strategic point on the battlefield, high ground. And if the Confederates took this ground and get some cannons up there, they're gonna, the cannons are going are gonna to rain down on the field, wipe the field, and march straight into Washington, the war will be over. Uh, but this general realizes it's undefended, like there's no one there. It's somehow been overlooked in the whole battle, this little, this little strategic hill. And then he sees I guess he sees, the story goes, I got to rent the movie. It's like 12 bucks on iTunes. I just didn't have time to get to it this week. But he sees the glint of bayonets on the rifles coming up the hill. The Confederate army is coming up the hill. And he turns around. He goes back to the troops. And he, just, he races back, starts ordering troops to this little um, round top. And gets just enough guys in just enough time. And one of these soldiers was this former English professor, wasn't even a professional soldier, but I think probably had a warrior's heart, Colonel Chamberlain, this guy Colonel Chamberlain. Warren told him, hold that hill. This is the strategic ground right here. It'll be won and lost right here. So they fight and fight and fight until they eventually run out of ammunition and everybody's expecting a retreat. But this Chamberlain guy says, fix bayonets, we're going to attack. And I guess they charged down this hill, shocked the Southern army, inspired the Union. They took a stand on that small, unlikely strategic point that turns the tide of the battle, the war, and the future of a nation. Here's my point. What if the most strategic territory in our lives is something small, seemingly insignificant, and has been overlooked? A small thing that could change everything. A small thing that is strategic because if you win there, you position yourself to win everywhere else in your life. And what if that small thing, small bit, small rudder, tiny flame is how we speak? I feel like that's what James is saying in chapter 3. Do you believe it? How would we behave if that were true? Let me get to application pretty quick. I want to propose four ways that... How we speak could be the small strategic thing that changes our lives. Number one, and how we speak, our self-talk. Imagine two people of equal ability facing a challenge. One says, there's no way I can do this. The other says, I think I can do it. Who's going to be able to do it? You know this, right? Right? Ever seen a sports team that does not believe they can win? My daughters uh, play soccer, and uh, I don't know if you've seen soccer, but like one goal in soccer is the end of the world. It's like a catastrophe, right? It's especially stressful on us because our, our one daughter's a goalkeeper. I got two daughters in soccer now. There. That's you, honey. No texting. We're talking about, I'm talking about you right now. She was uh, when, when one goal is scored in soccer, you can um, see the visible depression like on the team that they slump. There's this training to get their mental game together when something has happened. And how they speak to each other and how they speak in your mental game plays into that. Uh, conversely, have you ever seen a sports comeback where the underdog starts to believe that they, the underdog team, that they can actually win and the momentum shifts? Seen that? Don't you love that? Same team, something different? Shift happens. Calm. 
Calm. Our self-talk plays into that. Does anyone doubt that saying, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it while trying to do something is going to affect your ability to succeed at that? Speaking something out in some way makes it real. It's like when you write down your goals. Have you seen that? When you write down your goals, the odds of achieving that goal go way up. It gets, it gets out there. If I, if I would argue this biblically, I would say, have you ever noticed God's method for creation in Genesis 1? Then God said, let there be light. Then God said, let there be a space between the waters. Then God said, let lights appear in the sky. Reality gets spoken into existence. In some ways, that principle still works in our lives, right? You speak something out yourself. Number two, how our words are powerful. How we speak to others. Who thinks relationships are an important part of life? Who thinks that a relationship uh, can change the whole course of your life? As I stand here on my 23rd anniversary to say, change the whole course of my life. Despite Pastor Brad's best intention to undo that, as we heard last week. Now, who thinks communication is important in relationships? I actually Googled for fun relationship skills. Everybody from psychology today to wherever, number one, communication. 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 So, in your life, have you discovered the power of words like, I'm sorry? That's a powerful couple of words there. In fact, I would say Canada built a whole nation on, I'm sorry. I'm not even joking, like, this probably based on four things, like maple syrup, poutine, hockey, and I'm sorry. <laughs> you got yourself a nation. Maybe that's why they didn't have a civil war. That could be right there. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, too. And it ended, like, there was no. <laughs> Let's just have French and English schools. Okay. <laughs> that wasn't planned. Um, maybe my Canadian friends who watch me online are going to be, like, writing in, What? Um, powerful words, I, I'm sorry, you know this. If you're married, you know this. If you're, if you're dating, you know this. Okay, how about I love you? Powerful words. Why is that so hard to say sometimes? I think because it's, it's powerful. Ever seen that same scene in a romantic comedy where the couple is fighting or something, it's getting emotionally charged, and the guy suddenly blurts out, I love you, and then everyone freezes? Because that changes the whole, everything's changed now. Everything's changed. Words are powerful. Ever had someone you admire or whose opinion you value compliment you? Say, wow, you did, that was really good, what you did. How did, how did that affect you? How did that make you feel? Ever had someone important to you criticize you? Maybe a parent or a spouse or a mentor or express annoyance, or get angry at you, or even yell at you? How did that affect you? How did that affect the relationship? All of us, I bet here, have a friend who needs to use a filter when they speak, right? Don't you have that friend? Don't say everything that pops into your mind. Filter, filter. And if you can't think of anyone in your group of friends who is like that, you know what that means, right? Yeah, it's you. It is you. Your friends have been calling me and asking to talk to you, but I've been busy, so I haven't had a chance yet. Number three, the power of words. How we talk about others. Oh. Let's agree that humans tend to form groups. Even without the zombie apocalypse, people want to hook up with a crew to survive. It's how we're wired. There's a reason that psychology is a different discipline than sociology. Humans are one thing. Humans together is a bit of a different animal, right? And within groups, there's always conflict. Conflict is normal and natural, and we typically deal with it badly. When we don't like someone or disagree with them, quite often we don't tell them. We tell someone else. It's called triangulating, because really this is where the discussion should be, but then we bring this other person in. You may have been triangulated before. Someone's trying to onboard you onto their side of this, right? If I told you today that I heard some people talking negatively about, your, about you behind your back, how would that make you feel? Right? 
How might that affect community? How might that affect relationships? Man, if we could deal with that, how we talk to each other, uh, we'd be good we would be in good position to tackle how groups of people talk about other groups of people. Now we're one step away from world peace. Let me just say this. With two people, you have a, you have a relationship. With three people, you have a community. It's different. The importance of the fact that God expresses himself and indeed exists as a trinity and not a duality, cannot be overstated. In Jesus, we are invited to a truly life-giving relationship. But as a trinity, God demonstrates and invites us into a truly life-giving community. That's something a little bit different and something powerful. The church is meant to be that community. The church is meant to be a contrast community. We are meant to demonstrate to the world how to live with God, with God and each other. And that should be reflected in how we speak about each other, especially when someone's not there. We could talk about gossip. You probably, guys have probably heard how damaging that can be. We won't get into it right now just for time. But number four on the power words, how or even if we talk with God. Uh, I'm just going to hold up Pastor Brad. He's not here. I threw him under the bus last week. I'm going to hold him up this week. I've really been struck uh, just since moving here and working with uh, Brad again, how his prayer life has changed and deepened since I, I had spent time with him before. Uh, Pastor Brad just really talks with Jesus like a friend, like exactly how you would talk with a person. It's called conversational prayer. And I recognize that there are lots of different kinds of prayer. However, I noticed uh, that when we pray, have you noticed that when we pray, we can uh, sometimes get, it can get like really either ceremonial or, oh Lord. If your hand starts doing this when you're praying, I don't know. Uh, we can be formulaic. Start praying in formulas, right? As opposed to just relating. We can be super bold. We can su be super loud. Sometimes I like, I like declaration. I just talked with a colleague this week who had an experience of someone, you know, praying, come to me, all of you are heavy laden. I will give you rest. And I just want to say today is that you don't have to pray in heavy metal. <laughs> you, you, you can pray in smooth jazz or, or pop or country or even hip hop. Or you could just talk normal with Jesus. By the way, I don't recommend praying in rap unless you're really good at rhyming because it's really going to limit what you're going to be able to <laughs> communicate there. So I'm not aiming at critiquing styles of prayer. Here's what I'm aiming for. How much difference in your life would a little real talking with God make? And what if talking at God turned into talking with God? What difference could one word from God make in your life, in my life? Think that could change your life? Let me conclude with this. Small, seemingly unimportant things can have an incredibly strategic impact in our lives. James tells us that how we speak is like the little round top of our lives. Jesus seems to agree. Listen to this in Matthew 15, 10 and 11, and then I'm going to skip forward a bit to 18 to 20. This is, this is Jesus speaking now. Then Jesus called the crowd to come and hear. Listen, he said, and try and understand. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. And 18 and 20, the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. For from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. These are what defile you. And so, once again, Jesus takes us upstream to the source of our words and our actions in our inner life, the heart, the mind, and the soul. So, Let's take back that territory in our lives. In a minute, I'm going to ask God to move in our hearts in that way. We're going to ask God uh, to just be present in our self-talk, and that's going to be positive. We're going to come into agreement with what God is doing in our lives, and we're going to speak faith in our own lives, and we're going to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We're going to speak faith over each other. Romans 14, 19, So then, let us aim for harmony in the church 
and try to build each other up. While we're being slow to speak from James chapter 1 and thinking about what we're going to say, we can assess what we're going to say with a single criteria. Will my words build this person up or tear them down? And then let's be careful how we speak about each other. Conflicts are natural. The biblical model of dealing with that is not as natural. It's going direct in love and not triangulating. Let's practice that until it becomes natural. And most of all, let's talk with Jesus. There's the most strategic territory on the battlefield right there. If we're going to die on a hill, let it be this one. Staying connected to Jesus, keeping those lines of communication open, and keeping that relationship intact. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and your teaching uh, and how you guide us, this incredible blessing that we can have the word and study it and learn. I thank you for the book of James and the invitation to not just listen to sermons and listen to the word, but to be doers of the word and to actually live in the kingdom. You're inviting us into this incredible kingdom life. We thank you. We celebrate you. And so now, Lord, we submit this strategic territory in our lives, um, our mouths, our tongues, how we speak, Lord. Transform our self-talk, Lord. Uh, uh, teach us how we can speak to each other in life-giving ways. Teach us uh, uh, to have the discipline uh, in how we speak about each other. And uh, Lord, help us to learn to talk with you every day. Show us the way, Lord. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.